entitled this sermon, God's Gifts for the Benefit and Protection of His Church. He knew that as human beings that there would need to be various gifts that would be given. And even though they would be given to human beings, he would be involved in those gifts so that the church could uh, benefit and be protected from all the dangers. And there's no time when that is more needed than in the last days. So I believe we need these special gifts. In Ephesians 4, verse 11, it gives a short list. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. But probably a more complete list is found in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. It says, And God has set some in the church, first, apostles, secondarily, prophets, thirdly, teachers, after that, miracles, then, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. One of them that we had a worker at Youth for Jesus, she was a volunteer, a mother of one of the young people. And she told me, I feel I've had the gift of helps. And wow, was she a help. No matter what we needed, she was willing to do it. She was willing to help cook, she was willing to drive, she was willing to pick up things at the store, uh, just whatever was needed. What a blessing it was. And so all of these are important and we don't really have time to talk about all of them. But let's look at the list, kind of, you know, condensing it into one list. What are the gifts that were given for the church? Well, he makes it clear in 1 Corinthians that the most important gift is the gift of being an apostle. And when you really think about it, the 12 apostles and the others that came along who were called apostles, what a tremendous blessing that has been for the Christian church ever since that time. The second one he mentions is prophets. And uh, again, Tremendous blessing. What if we hadn't had all the prophets down through the ages? And suppose we were just missing one prophet, the last one. We'd really be in bad condition. And so God has really blessed the church with those gifts. Then there's kind of a group of individuals that could probably go under the heading of teachers. But also, they can be called a pastor. They could be called an evangelist. Those are to instruct the church, and God works through them to instruct and to reach the people outside of the church as well. Then we have uh, miracle workers. And we do still hear about miracles. I think that we hear about it less in the United States than we do in some other countries. But nonetheless, that was supposed to be a part of the church. There are times when miracle is needed. It's the only solution to the problem. And God has said, I will uh, give the church miracle workers. Then most of us probably have been blessed by someone that had the gift of healing. It's, in a sense, a slow miracle when we're healed by natural means, but it's still a miracle. And so uh, God gives special wisdom to some people 
They just seem to know exactly what to do that's going to bring about healing. And what a blessing they are to the rest of us. And then the gift of helping. You may not have uh, your own specific area, but you have been given an enjoyment, uh, the desire to help those that do have a specific area to carry out the work. And no one person can accomplish everything that needs to be done. Then we have the gift of governing, management. You know, I haven't given up the idea of a center down in Trenton that's there every day. But I have been praying for somebody with the gift of management because without that, it will cost too much and it will fail anyway. But <clears throat> God has promised that he put in the church people who have the gift of management. They can govern. They can, uh, you know, face all the decisions that have to be made and make uh, good decisions. <clears throat> and another one is the gift of speaking languages. <clears throat> we... Uh, actually could use that gift in the United States more than we used to because there are various groups that <clears throat> have come to the U.S. and they're not able to speak the language well. <clears throat> and so God has given that gift to some people that they can pick up another language well. I know he didn't give it to me, but I was amazed at our son Wayne. He picked up several languages and he seemed to be able to pick them up quickly. And the Lord planned for him to work in French speaking uh, Quebec. And so that's where he is and carrying on his ministry there in that. And they say that he can preach uh, just as well in French as he could have in English. So, praise the Lord for all these gifts. And we could spend some time on each one, but <clears throat> we won't have time to do that today. I do want to talk about one, however. After explaining the special gifts that he has put in the church, we see the purpose of these gifts. In Ephesians 4, verses 12 to 14. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So Paul quickly goes through a, a lot of blessings and we'll look at them in my own words. What is the purpose of all these gifts? Number one, they are needed to keep the church growing. Some of you grow gardens, and you know that if a plant doesn't keep growing, it will die. A church that doesn't keep growing is going to die. And so the gifts that God has given is to help the church to grow. Second, so that we can have a... Com <coughs> complete ministry to the world. Not just a one-sided ministry, but to have all aspects of the ministry that it requires to make a church grow. <coughs> I'm very thankful for the diabetes seminar because it is fast 
getting to the point where if we do not approach people on something else other than the Bible, they won't let us approach them. They're burned out on the Jehovah's Witness and the different groups that knock on their door and, you know, try to, to push them. And so they are not as interested. This still can be done, but it's, it's not as, as possible. So God wanted a complete ministry. Also, the church needed instruction because just because we're baptized doesn't mean that we know everything that we're supposed to know. And so part of the ministry is to instruct the church. And the objective of instruction is to bring the church into unity with Christ. When we are unified with Jesus, we're unified with each other. So we get both of the blessings through the gifts that God has given to bring about this uh, unity with Jesus. Number five, to become mature Christians, not to stay as children, uh, just getting started in the Christian life, but to become mature Christians and actually to become fully like Jesus is the purpose. And the last one, to protect us against heresy. And those are on the increase. And sad to say, we're at a day where you can even hear heresy from the pulpit. Um, so, you know, that's the least place we would expect it to happen, to have someone uh, preaching at our church and presenting heresy. But it is happening today. So, God had a plan to protect against all those things and he set up all these gifts so that the church could really accomplish its mission. Out of that list, I want to talk to you about one. Now, I'm not talking to you about this because I think somebody here has got a problem in this area. But while I was away, I read a very interesting chapter about the work of the pastor and in some respects it opened my eyes to some things and uh, I thought maybe it would be of help to some of you as well. In the fifth testimonies page 298 it says many do not look upon preaching as Christ's appointed means of instructing his people and therefore always to be what? Highly prized. You know, I was uh, blessed by my mother's practice. When she heard a sermon, she always took notes on the sermon. When we had to clean out her apartment, I had to throw away dozens of books where she had taken notes on every sermon that she had ever heard, I guess. And if she didn't have a book with her, she just took a piece of paper and took notes. I would say she must have understood this because to her, she wanted to make sure she got the message and she also wanted to look at it again when she went home. But it says many do not look upon preaching as Christ's appointed means of instructing his people and therefore always to be highly prized. <clears throat> they do not feel that the sermon is the word of the Lord to them and estimated by the value of the truths spoken but they judge it as they would the speech of a lawyer at the bar. Now, I haven't heard of any of that here, but I have heard it other places. I have definitely heard that as people critically look at the sermon that was given, they judge it like the speech of a lawyer at the bar. 
by the argumentative skill displayed. So as they, they look at, well, how, how good was he at establishing his points? By the argumentative skill displayed and the power and beauty of the language. You know, does he have the gift of speech? Does, does it charm the mind? And of course, those who have that gift are paid attention to more, perhaps, not always, but people do like to hear them speak. The minister is not infallible, but God has honored him by making him his messenger. So God doesn't want us to go into either ditch on this. He doesn't want us to think that the minister cannot make a mistake, cannot say something that's not correct. But on the other hand, to know that God has chosen him or her, sometimes we have that today, has chosen the pastor to be his messenger. And you know, there are occasions where when I'm shaking hands, someone goes by and said, Pastor Atwood, I know that message was just for me today. But in a sense, it's for everyone, and it's not from the pastor, it's from God. Amen. Going on in that paragraph, it says, If you listen to him as though he were not commissioned from above, you will not respect his words, nor receive them as the message of God. Your souls will not feed upon the heavenly manna. Doubts will arise concerning some things that are not pleasing to the natural heart, and you will sit in judgment upon the sermon as you would upon the remarks of a lecturer or a political speaker. So we have two choices, either to see it as a message from God and to seriously pay attention to it and to look for what we are supposed to benefit out of it and bring changes into our life. See it as the manna, the heavenly manna. Or we are going to question and find fault and so on with the message that was given. Now, <clears throat> You'll notice that it calls it the message of God. It's not a message the same as a prophet's message because they have seen a vision, they have seen a dream, and they are passing on what God revealed to them. But in, in some other sense, a lesser than that, God does something to help the pastor present something that the church has need of. I guess some pastors can get pretty bad, though, because I read one time where Ellen White was sitting and there was a sermon going on, but it was so bad she didn't listen. She just read her Bible. So, uh, you know, I guess we have to mention that at least in this situation. But generally, what God's plan, well, we know what his plan is to present a message that the church needs each Sabbath. Same chapter, Fifth Testimonies, page 300. We are never to forget that Christ teaches through his servants. When you really look at two or three of these sentences, what it says to me is that God makes the church dependent upon the pastor to some degree. To some degree, they are dependent upon the pastor. Now, if they don't have a pastor, or if they're somewhere else where they, they can't be benefited, then God will help them. But how many times would the church be protected against some deception had they listened carefully to each sermon that had been given to them. That's the idea I get here. You can check it out, see if, if that's right. We are never to forget that Christ teaches through his servants. There may be conversions without the instrumentality of a sermon, where 
persons are so situated that they are deprived of every means of grace, they are wrought upon by the Spirit of God and convinced of the truth through reading the Word. But God's appointed means of saving souls is through the foolishness of preaching. Now, if you look at that, it shows that if you're in a situation where you have a pastor, and he's a true pastor, then he allows you to be dependent on that pastor. But if you're way out, you know, where there is no church and no pastor, then the Holy Spirit will work directly to help in, in that missing link from the, the church. Page 301, the man is to be regarded and honored only as God's ambassador. So there's a danger on both sides. I see a growing dislike of pastors in the Adventist church today. And I believe pastors are partly responsible for that. They have not been as faithful to their work as God wanted them to be. And it has caused a loss of confidence. But on the other hand, there are a few pastors where the danger is worship of the pastor. And that is not a good thing either. Either one of those is not good. The man is to be regarded and honored only as God's ambassador. To praise the man is not pleasing to God. The message he brings is to be brought to the test of the Bible. So two interesting things that the congregation needs to do. Number one, they must not praise the individual, either privately in their own minds or, uh, you know, to the pastor. They don't. That's not a good thing. I heard of one pastor who had a lady as she was leaving she was shaking his hand and telling him that that was the most wonderful sermon that she ever heard. It was, he was just going on about it. And uh, he said to her, Sister, the devil already told me that. To try to help her wake up to what she was doing. And the second thing is, and really, if, if you don't take notes, you can't do this so well. But go home. And check it out to see if it's according to God's word. Repeating it will make sure that we get more from that message and that we won't miss what the message was about. The reason, of course, why we need to do that is that Isaiah 8.20 says, To the law and to the testimony, which the law is the five books of the Bible that Moses wrote, the testimony is all the rest, written by the prophets. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And we need to be able to distinguish between what is true light and what isn't. And one of the examples in the Bible is, and I failed to put the text down, but I think it was Acts 9, they, that is the Bereans, received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, if you look at that carefully, you'll see both steps there. As they looked at Paul, they received his message as from God. But that didn't make them go to sleep. They went home and they checked out what he said to see if it was true. And so both of these things exist here, yes. Acts 1711. Oh, excuse me, 1711. Acts 1711. Here's another interesting one, Fifth Testimonies 301. If the preaching is of an emotional character, it will affect the feelings, but not the heart and conscience. Now, you won't get emotional sermons from me. 
maybe it's because I grew up in New England, you know. But uh, some of the more popular speakers are emotional in their messages. But I learned as a young man the fallacy of that. I was, uh, you know, in academy, but I was living at an Adventist hospital where they had a small dormitory and working at the hospital. And so there were about four or five other guys there in the dorm. And a pastor came. He was called the crying pastor because he had such emotional presentations and it caused such big revivals to take place. And so, all of a sudden, all of these other young guys started praying. I mean, before that, they hadn't been doing it. They started reading their Bible, and they went to all the meetings, and they, they accepted the calls, and they went down front, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. What's changed in this dormitory? But a week after that pastor left, they were right back to the same as what they'd had before. And I, I woke up to the fact that emotional preaching is not the answer. It says, such preaching results in no lasting good, but it often wins the hearts of the people and calls out their affections for the man who pleases them. So, you know, I don't know whether anybody here really likes emotional preaching, but if you do, you might want to consider that paragraph. It's pretty clear. It says it will affect the feelings, but it doesn't affect the heart and the conscience. That's a serious flaw. And also, it calls out their affections for the human instrument, but it doesn't have any lasting good to it. And so God is asking pastors not to be like that and asking us to realize that that's not the best. In Acts 9, verses 17 and 18, we have an interesting example of how important a pastor is. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. Now God could have done that without the pastor being involved. But God said, no, I am going to teach Paul the importance of this gift that I have put in the church. It's no, it's no honor to the human agent. Only if the human agent allows God to work. But other than that, it is the work of God, but through human beings. And so Paul received his sight. He received... Uh, the infilling of the Holy Spirit through Ananias. And that is explained in Acts of the Apostles, page 122. When, in the midst of his blind error and prejudice, Saul was given a revelation of the Christ whom he was persecuting, he was placed in direct communication with the church, which is the light of the world. And you've probably heard mission stories where an angel came and talked to some tribal leader. But what did the angel do? The angel sent him to see a Seventh-day Adventist and to be connected with the church. <clears throat> In this case, Ananias represents Christ and also represents Christ's ministers upon the earth who are appointed to act in his stead. So Ananias was performing a responsibility and it was in the absence of Jesus, he was given 
this responsibility. In Christ's stead, Ananias touches the eyes of Saul that he may receive sight. In Christ's stead, he places his hands upon him. And as he prays in Christ's name, Saul receives the Holy Ghost. All is done in the name and by the authority of Christ. You see, not the individual. And that's one thing that pastors need to remember constantly because if people do praise them, they are in danger of forgetting all is done in the name and by the authority of Christ. Christ is the fountain. The church is the channel of communication. And yet, he uses those ministries that we uh, read about. Oops. That we read about to accomplish the mission. And we're just looking at one of them, but all of them are very, very valuable. Now, sometimes the pastor thinks when he's ordained that he's, uh, you know, been given certain powers. But notice what this says, Acts of the Apostles 162. When the ministers of the church of believers in Antioch laid their hands upon Paul and Barnabas, they, by that action, asked God to bestow his blessing upon the chosen apostles in their devotion to the specific work to which they had been appointed. So we, we read about the ordination of Paul and Barnabas, and they were called by God to work among the Gentiles. But notice, uh, it was God's blessing that was put upon them. The church couldn't give any blessing to them. And uh, also, in the next paragraph, it says, At a later date, <clears throat> the right of ordination by the laying on of hands was greatly abused. Unwarrantable importance was attached to the act, as if a power came at once upon those who received such ordination, which immediately qualified them for any and all ministerial work. So, maybe there would be less clamoring for ordination if people really understood that. There's no power that a person has. God has the power, and he will work, if the pastor is in the right relationship to God, he will work, but it's nothing that the pastor possesses, it's all from God. And he uses human instruments. It's very important for the pastor to understand that as well. But in the setting apart of these two apostles, there is no record indicating that any virtue was imparted by the mere act of laying on of hands. There is only the simple record of their ordination and of the bearing that it had on their future work. So the Bible doesn't support uh, special powers being given through ordination to any human being, but God makes that human being dependent forever upon him. If he's going to do his work properly, he is totally dependent on God. And if God is able to work, then the then his ministry will be a blessing. Well, I found that interesting on some points that I hadn't really uh, thought about, and I hope that it will be a help to you to understand the work that God has given, not just to me. I feel pretty loved here in this church, but your life crosses other pastors, and so God has given us here a very... Uh, important bit of instruction. You might like to read the whole chapter when you get home there in Fifth Testimonies. In fact, that's a, a wonderful book. There's other chapters I want to uh, spend some time on because there's some excellent counsel 
for God's people in that book.